Hello, and welcome to Bandstand, the official podcast of the Tennessee Bandmasters Association. I'm your host, David Adelit, and I hope you'll join us on a journey through the past, present, and future of bands in Tennessee. We'll delve into the rich history of Tennessee bands, uncovering the hidden gems and legendary figures who shaped the state's band landscape. We'll survey the present, where you'll meet the movers and shakers of today, gaining insights from their expertise and experiences. And we'll gaze towards the future, exploring the exciting possibilities that await Tennessee's school bands. Uh, On this episode, we're joined by Randall Coleman, the director of bands at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga and the president of the National Band Association. We also have Joel Denton, the president-elect of uh, Tennessee Music Education Association and the NBA state chair for Tennessee. And we have two of our bandstand co-hosts, J.R. Baker, our TBA president, and Joanne Hood, a recent contestant on The Price is Right. So (laughs) thanks, everyone, for being on here. And uh, Joanne, can I say, come on down? (laughs) Tomorrow. <laughs> it's going to be fun. I think we're all, all of us that know you just can't wait to see what really happened. So, so Randall, there are a lot of offerings uh, on the NBA website, uh, composition contests, awards, mentor projects. Of all those things, what is the stuff that gets you the most excited? Well, I think, um, of course, our composition contests are, are kind of like our crown jewels, uh, with the Ravelli composition and, and uh, all the other ones that, that we're doing. And we have some new things on the pipeline, too, that I'd like to share a little, a little bit later on. Um, but also uh, all of the mentoring uh, options that are there for our young teachers. I think that's a really important mission for our organization is to be there and to provide all the support and help we can for our young teachers. So uh, I think those are the things that I'm most proud of right now. Can you talk a little bit about the Dr. William P. Foster Project and then the Music Education Alliance? What is that? Yeah, that was an initiative that was launched uh, several presidencies before mine. Uh, It began with with, uh, when Scott Casagrande was president and and carried through, uh, of course, up to today. Uh, And it was a a joint effort by the National Band Association, uh, CBDNA, and Music for All, uh, to provide assistance for underfunded programs or uh, underrepresented programs that, that might not have all the opportunities that other programs would have uh, through a collaboration with those three groups and, and working with some of our instrument manufacturers. And it's, and it's kind of a, a unique thing. You know, the National Band Association has a history of starting projects, getting them up and running, and then they kind of grow their own legs and they they run on their own. And then just this year, that, that's what's happening with the Foster Project. It has its own board now and its own funding. So uh, it, it's flying on its own. And uh, we have some really important and really um, exciting new things uh, along those lines uh, for MBA. Uh, and it, I'll give you just a little teaser. Uh, we've been working with the Iowa Bandmasters Association for the last three years uh, on an equity project uh, with the Iowa Bandmasters. And that has developed now into what we're calling the Access Collective. And that's going to be available um, to uh, in a, several more states. It's just been with Iowa for the last three years, but we're ready to pilot it with a couple of more states moving forward to provide support um, for uh, equality, culture, I mean, creating co- a culture of inclusion, diversity, and equity, and awareness in the classrooms, and providing experts to work with teachers uh, to help uh, build that kind of culture in your band rooms. So we're really excited about the Access Collective. It's it's wonderful when those kind of programs begin to sort of take off and do their own thing, when they get that kind of energy that takes them into something that's maybe greater than what people imagined in the first place. Yeah, and that's exactly what happened with this. It was uh, our state chair, Mary Crandall, in Iowa several years ago that said, hey, I think this would be a great idea. And it has just blossomed. And, uh, you know, we're, we're really excited to stand behind this and, uh, and try to get this out to more states than just Iowa now. Okay, so one of the, one of the big things, I, I was state chair 100,000 years ago. And uh, one of the things everyone asked all the time is, what does MBA, what can it benefit me? 
me as a high school band director, me as a middle school band director. What are the benefits and why should I pay that money? You know, what's it going to, what's it giving me? Yeah, and, and that's something that we strive for every year to, to make sure that our members and potential members see the value and the validity in the organization. Uh, you know, I joined NBA in 1982 because I was uh, the assistant director for a, a gentleman that probably you guys know. Uh, it's a guy named Larry Vollman. Uh, my first two years teaching, I was Larry's assistant and he was a member of NBA. So I'm like, well, that's what I need to do. Uh, so but that that kind of um, energy doesn't really exist anymore. We have to prove our worth now. And and I really think just a cursory glance at the website with our selective music list, with the mentoring projects, with, uh, you know, our our grants and our concert band symposium. And, you know, it, it's really there's just a multitude of things that MBA can help uh, our young teachers and any teacher uh, within their daily classroom lives. Yeah. What you said there about joining because Larry told you that's what you're supposed to do. That's kind right. of the same thing with me. You know, I was taught, uh, Roddy Webb told me that you you need to be a member of your professional organizations, all of them. Um, and, you know, they will right. benefit. It, it's, you know, we used to think of it as I'm serving the profession, and I still do. It's the, the highest honor I have to serve the profession. And um, that was an opportunity to do that for me, serving as as state chair in Georgia years ago uh, and then chairing the selective music list committee for several years. And and then finally being elected to second vice president and first vice president. Uh, I I never imagine when I look at the list of past presidents of NBA and see the names that are on there. And then I like how in the world did I ever get in this group of people? Uh, it's it's an honor and it's a, it's something that, um, you know, that, that's really meaningful to me and anything I can do for the profession. And if we can just cultivate that again, you know, I, I don't think it's there right now in a lot of places. But, you know, I, I think it's it's our job to help try to get that back. If you if you had a magic wand, Randall, and you could just wave it and fix the main problem you see as the president as far as what MBA can do for band directors in the country, what would it be? I think it would be to tell, and I keep focusing on the young teachers, but to tell our young teachers that it's okay to ask for help. You know, when, when I was a young teacher, you didn't have to ask for help. It was just there. The people would just come in your band room. Let me help you. And, and we were okay with that. And, it, you know, we're, we're a little bit different society right now. And, and I think our young teachers tend to think if they ask for help, it's a sign of weakness. Uh, and it's the total opposite. It's a sign of strength. Uh, even now, I love for people to get in front of my ensemble and listen to my ensemble. What can we do to be better? And um, it, it's really difficult because our, our institutions of higher ed don't do a very good job of preparing our teachers to go out and be band directors. There's just not enough time. Uh, and there's a lot of people asking for pieces of the puzzle. So when it, it can be overwhelming that you get out there and, you know, how do you pick literature? Where do you find that? Where do you go? You know, do you just go to Pepper's website and go editor's choice? That must be it, you know? Um, and that's really tough. And just the issues of dealing with administrators and dealing with parents and dealing with colleagues and, you know, it's just crazy. And, and these young teachers need to, to know that it's okay to ask for that help and then listen to the help. Uh, I think that would be my one greatest wish. Yeah. You are, uh, you're listing all our content for future episodes right there, by the way, because a lot of those things <laughs> are going to be, are going to become episodes on this. Like I've got some friends that were, uh, on the athletic side when I was fine arts director in Williamson County, that are going to come on and talk about, Awesome. You know, the topic of can band coexist with athletics and that sort of thing. Of course, mm -hmm. we all know it can. So uh, so those kind of things are important. I want to get back to the, the music list. Uh, we've had some conversations on the podcast about choosing music, and Barry Krause has done some research that's pretty interesting. And one of the things that he's, that he's talked about is that the younger teachers are really looking for professional development on music choices. So what can we do to sort of shepherd them and, and this could be for anybody on this panel 
uh, what can we do to help the younger teachers with what to play? Again, speaking for the NBA, I think our selected music list is one of our greatest uh, contributions to the profession. And we're working really hard to, to make that a more useful tool. We're investing money to make that a more useful tool. Uh, everybody should look for a, a new selected music list database that will allow you to, to ask and sort for a multitude of different things. And, you know, uh, I have weak clarinets. I need a grade four piece with, for weak clarinets. You can put that in the database and it gives you some options. Uh, I mean, it just does amazing things. It, and it also will, will uh, allow you to sort for underrepresented composers, uh, what, whatever you want to do. And uh, we're about ready to open that up probably uh, in the summer. Uh, the list will be up and available for everybody. And uh, it, it's really exciting. But we have to be careful that the music that's on those lists is indeed quality literature. And that's where you get into the argument. What is quality literature? Where does it, you know, how do we determine what that is? And, you know, I, I've had some pretty heated discussions with some leaders in our profession recently that shied away from talking about what is quality. This person didn't want to talk to the students about quality. And I find uh, in my situation now that, one of the things we've worked the most hard to do over the last three years is to show our students what is good and you know what is a quality sound on your instrument. What is a quality band sonority? They don't, they don't know what that is in their mind, so it's hard for them to replicate that. And I think if we don't talk about quality, we're kind of rowing upstream in this problem. But I think the NBA Selective Music List is a great place, and it will be even better uh, we have marches. We have a march list that our military band conductors from D.C. have curated that list. Mm. The jazz list is about is undergoing a, a revision now uh, with a wonderful committee work on that list. So we're hoping that tool will be very, very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. That's the kind of thing I think the young teachers need is that, you know, I have one horn and I want to play grade three, whatever yep. that means. You know, how can I go about searching for that? And uh, that will be very beneficial for them because here's the thing, uh, and everybody on this podcast is going to agree, my, the, picking music is the number one thing band directors do. Ordering the buses is important, but picking music is, if it's not at the top, it's right near the top because sure. it sets the standard, it sets the, the baseline for the experience that the kids are going to have in your class, in the ensemble, in the rehearsal. And for young teachers who might be wishy-washy on whether or not they want to continue the profession, getting them to have earlier success and earlier confidence in their abilities to teach is huge to keep those young teachers going and for us to help mentor them and continue on and help them lay the tracks for great careers. Well, it's not an exaggeration to say that the music that we choose is the curriculum. Absolutely. That's what our curriculum is and it changes every year and for every group. But the, but how we structure that is the, is the most important thing that we do. I always, I always struggled with picking music. I, I would, it would, it would stress me out more than anything I think that I ever did. And, and sometimes I got it right. Sometimes I got it wrong. But I, I, I think one of the most important things I learned was when I got it wrong, change. It's never too late to change. I don't remember. I think Jolly was around playing a grade four with the ninth grade band and concert was awful. And I changed tunes in two weeks. It was awful. It was terrible. But I, I used to say, I wish somebody would just tell me, you have to play this. Mm -hmm. This is what you have to play. But I know that's not a reality. I don't know, Joanne. There's a couple of times you told me what I had to play, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard you tell people what not to play after their concert was over. <laughs> what not to play more than probably. Yeah. Joel, a question for you. Um, what is your vision or role as the state chair? What is your initiative? You have so many hats you're, you're wearing right now, Joel. As far as your NBA state chair hat, what does that look like? Yeah, I've got lots of plates in the air, it seems. Uh 
you know, there are so many things I would like to do as NBA chair that uh, financially we just haven't really, really been able to do that. When I was teaching, uh, we did the concert symposium two years. And, and that was, uh, but um, the Udwal Band Boosters helped finance some of that so that we could make that happen. And I haven't had the, the financing to be able to, to do that again uh, without charging a pretty significant fee for the bands to uh, participate. Uh, I, I think that R Randall is right. That is a great uh, tool. The other thing is just to make uh, our directors in our states of, uh, aware of what's available for uh, from MBA. And, and you know, I, I want to go back and address a couple of things that, that Randall said. And Randall knows me, my heart on this because I've talked with him and the board and in the state chair meetings about this before. Uh, in our profession right now, we talk a lot about DEI, talk a lot about DEI diversity, equity, inclusion. But DEI is useless without A. It's got to be D-E-I-A. There has to be accessibility. And uh, what I see as someone who, uh, you, know, you know, I have, this sounds like I'm tooting my horn. I'm not. Uh, this is from my heart. I, I get the opportunity to go to amazing band rooms. But I also get the opportunity to go to band rooms where the director is doing everything. He doesn't or she doesn't have a staff. And um, there, as the president-elect, soon to be president, Timmy A., I'm very aware that our state is made up of lots of small schools. Uh, yes, we, we have some uh, suburban, urban schools that are large schools, and, and, uh, and we have some urban programs, uh, in place that are helping finance some things for our uh, for our urban teachers, but we have a lot of rural schools, small schools uh, in our state uh, where that's not the case. The districts don't support the band programs. Uh, the districts don't support the band directors. They're not paying for professional development. Uh, they're not paying for membership into NAFME or TMEA or. MTSBOA or ETSBOA or West or WTSBOA or NBA. And uh, so one of the things that I would really like to see, and this is something I would like to talk with uh, JR as he takes over uh, TBA uh, about how we could uh, create a first time membership for uh our directors in the state of Tennessee to join TBA and NBA. Uh, and because once they get in, just like all of us, uh, once they get in, they'll see the benefit. I mean, when you get the Instrumentalist magazine, the Instrumentalist is one of the best magazines in our profession. The articles are always great. The NBA magazine has gotten so much better um, the last, 10 years. I mean, there was a time when it was very research uh, driven, uh, but it has gotten so much better. The, the information that's there. Randall talks, uh, was talking about the uh, NBA music list. That's the list that we operate from in Tennessee. We adopted that list statewide. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's, the things that I wish that our, our younger directors and our, even older directors who have never joined the association uh, could see that's uh, value for them. But the problem is that many of them uh, are paying those, those fees out of their pockets. They're paying all those membership dues out of their pockets. They're not making any money anyway. And, uh, and so it's a real struggle. I talked, I talked with uh, Megan Christian about it yesterday. We were talking about ETSBOA and some things. And that's, that's where my heart is. How, how can we uh, encourage, how can we make accessibility to our programs easier uh, for directors who don't have booster clubs or districts who will support them? And uh, it's, it's a struggle. It's, it's a real struggle in Tennessee. 
uh, with with all of all of our associations. It's a struggle across our nation right now. So that that's kind of where my heart starts. Yeah, that's and, a gr- that's a great question. Just I mean, I, in, a, in, in a larger sense, just I wonder about. I think I I'm, I'm becoming Jr's suggestion box, and he's going to get he's going to get tired of me. But <laughs> I wonder about can we have some sort of statewide uh, professional development for all first year band directors? And it's I don't you know, we can't say mandatory, but at least find some way to incentivize uh, people jumping on this this Zoom. And it could be a statewide thing. Jr. could be the the voice, and then we could do breakout rooms for East, Middle, and West. Part of that would be on what associations, how to join, what the NBA music list is, the things that we're talking about on this podcast, and just for those kids that need it, those young folks that need it right off the bat in their beginnings of their career. Uh, just to give them sort of a starter pack of information that can help them, you know, know where to start and know what to do. And maybe if you have a list of things you have to do, this is the most important, you know, like here's how to prioritize what your task list is every day, because this is what's going to, this will doing this today will help your band in March. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, uh, I, I agree, David. If I can jump on that, I think part of our problem is, uh, and this is not, again, we're talking about Tennessee here, uh, but this is a this is a problem across the country. Um, TMEA has its file that it's going to be responsible for. ETSBOA, MTSBOA, WTSBOA has its file. We're talking about band, but we could really say all the the vocal, the or you know, we can talk about all that. Uh, they have theirs. TBA is over here and they've got their thing. And then I'm the NBA state chair and I've got my thing. Yeah. And, and my, one of my visions for TMEA is to stop uh, looking at all those organizations as others and looking um, at them as we. Yeah, we need, you a, know, we need it, a flow chart <laughs> or yeah, organization yeah, well, chart. Yeah. Yeah. We, you know, we, we build culture in our band programs. We teach the us, we culture, not the I, me culture, but our professional organizations many times operate as I, me organizations instead of us, we, if we did things collectively, we would be much more uh, influential. Yeah. You know, you ask about the young band directors and the music selection. My favorite story is the, the teacher who had pl- the student teacher had played in Roy Holder's band when they played Midwest that came to my school. And I told him on the first fall concert, you're going to conduct a tune, go pick it out. You're going to get about eight hours of rehearsal. And he came back in and he says, you think they can play this? And he flipped it over and it was a colonial song. And I went wrong question. I said, do you think you can teach that in eight hours? I said, let's go to the library and let's find something that you can teach in the amount of time you're going to have. And then I told him, nobody can play that in eight, in eight hours. Uh, most people can't play it at all. And, and so I, 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 those are the kind of topics Randall is point on that we have to address uh, with young band directors. Randall, you have such a great story from high school band director in Georgia to the University of Alabama to Chattanooga and the great things that we all know you're doing there. Can you just kind of fill in the blanks, connect the dots on that whole, on your journey as a band director? Well, that's a loaded question. Uh, this is, uh, this is your 42 for me in, in front of a band. Um, and I did teach high school band in, in Georgia uh, for 25 years and was very active in the Georgia Music Educators Association and, and did a term as president of, of GMEA. And that's where I thought I would retire from. I would just retire as a very happy high school band director. I had a great situation the last school I was in and uh, wonderful students, great theater program. And, and then this little thing in my head said, why don't you see if you can teach teachers now? Uh, see if that that'll happen. And I never dreamed in a million years. I grew up in Alabama, a huge Alabama fan. Uh, never imagined that I would be there. And lo and behold, I woke up driving to work in Tuscaloosa every day for 14 years and thought I would retire from there. And uh, then 
a little birdie from UTC called and I'm like, well, maybe, maybe one more. Let's see. <laughs> so then here I am living in Chattanooga, a city that I've been through a bazillion times in my career, but never thought about living here. And uh, here we are. And uh, I'm excited about going to work every day. Uh, it's a challenge. Uh, it, it was a, a program that had fallen on some hard times and uh, we had 33 students on the first roster for our marching band three years ago. And I was like, yeah, they're small, but at least they're you know, college kids. They'll be able to play. And then I forgot about COVID and all of that. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, everybody at UTC has been wonderful. The whole state has been wonderful uh, with support of what, what we're trying to do at UTC. So uh, it's exciting to go to work every day. I can say your, your presence is felt. It's, the ground is the ground is kind of trembling a little bit because of what you're doing with that band program. In ten years, what will folks say about the band program at UTC? Um, I, I hope they will look at us at a place where um, a lot of good young band directors are coming from UTC now, and uh, they have a wealth of knowledge, and uh, they they have a network of support uh, from the folks at UTC. Um, so I, I hope when I, when I eventually drive my car down to my place in Florida and stay there forever, uh, <laughs> that's what people think, you know, and, uh, I'm a little bit sad that I don't have another 15 or 20 years in me to, to, to fully ride this thing out. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's fun. And I, I just hope it's better today than it was when we got here. I'm so glad it you're is. there. Anybody else? Final thoughts? Randall has changed the culture at UTC, uh, and and it's a what he has done is a roadmap for anybody going into a program uh, how to how to build that kind of collective culture, that cohesive thought uh, from not just for the band but throughout the university and the community, and we are fortunate Absolutely. to have him in Chattanooga. And yes. Thank you. It's um... We've still got a long way to go, but everybody, like I say, it takes a village and uh, everybody from our chancellor on down has just been so supportive of, of what we're trying to do. And, you know, it, we're educating like high school, middle school teachers have to educate their administrators and educate their parents. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. Uh, I'm trying to educate our administration on, you know, to have a viable university band program. There are some things that have to happen. Yep. So they, they've all been great. And uh, I really have, have nothing but wonderful things to say about our community here at UTC. Well, thank you all for being on the podcast tonight. Really excited about hearing how this turns out. And I know that it's going to be great information for our band directors in Tennessee. And Randall, I know you're, you've been here for a while, but just we're so glad you're here. We're so glad you're in the state and for all the great things that you're doing at UTC. Thank you. It's uh, it's like my second home. I've worked here a lot when I taught in other places I, by judging and doing clinics. And uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, Joanne Hood will always be my special angel and uh, as well, Jr. And, uh, you know, it, it's a great place to be. Thanks for listening to Bandstand. If you have topic suggestions or need to get in touch with us, email us at tbabandstandpodcast at gmail.com. Your input is important to us. And if you have a topic you'd like us to discuss about the past, present, or future of Tennessee bands, please let us know. Again, that email is tbabandstandpodcast at gmail.com. Right now, we're broadcasting on Spotify and YouTube, so please subscribe, review, and rate. Box 5, please. And more importantly, share this podcast with your friends. See you next week. <laughs>